Okay, this is something a little bit random. Do you guys all have like a revelation which you hold to your heart deeper than anything else? Is there something that's been just a, a revelation to you out of the Word of God that almost every time you speak and every time you preach somewhere in there, it comes out that God's revealed to you? Well, I, I find all my messages come back to a central thought of perseverance often. Wow. I think that's been my story and how God met me. And I think that always comes through. Yeah. I think not only my perseverance or hanging, but rather God's perseverance and his love for people and his yeah. outworking and the process of sanctification and all of that. I think that's a consistent thing that I wow. find just coming alive in scripture all the time. And I think probably uh, not just the process, but where he's taking me. And so that it's not about perfection, but rather a pursuit of perfection but that sometimes what we think is perfect is not necessarily what really is right. perfect and that God's perfect talking about, yeah. Yeah. again, removing that meistic kind of view yeah. of what's perfect for me, but really about what's perfect in me reflecting Christ yeah. and becoming more like him. And that excites me, like that, that sense of moving towards this idea that Jesus said, the kingdom's here and it's a whole way of thinking. It's completely upside awesome. down, inside out, yeah, well. but you're on a process and it's beautiful. So that's my thing. Mm -hmm. Rich? Yeah, I, I think probably for me, it's that God's for me. God's for you. Yeah, oh, wow, just, just as simple, you know, growing up, that wasn't probably a thought that crossed my mind terribly often about the people who surrounded me in my right. world. And, uh, but as God just progressively revealed himself to me, I'm just like this, I, I would regularly get undone, uh, even this morning after I'd lectured in a college today, um, one of the students at the end of it just said, look, I'm having a really tough time. and part of the toughness of their time was the extraordinary grace of God for them. Mm -hmm. That where they had been rejecting him and pushing him away, God just kept pressing in and, and it was painful for them. And, uh, and for me, I totally understand that journey and I'm you know there sitting with them, talking to them and all the rest of it, feeling it. Because mm -hmm. it's like, God's for me. And no matter what I may have done at any point in time, yeah. deliberate, unthinking, whatever, mm -hmm. He's for me, and that's that's hard yeah. at one level. That's yeah. that's like hard because it's wow, oh, how can you be like that? Wow. And I know what I'm like. How can you be like <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah. Like seriously, but when he's like that, it's just, it undoes you yeah. at the core. And what uh, the only thing you can do is worship. Yeah. Right. The right. only that's thing you can do is is just go before him in humility and just extraordinary sense of love and appreciation and thankfulness and worship of him because how magnificent is that and that is our god how phenomenal and that's this issue of knowing and yeah. living it yeah, and yeah. you know yeah. It, yeah. which is crucial yeah. wow. anyway, Pam said too much how do you follow that i know um, <laughs> give up um i think for me it's it's similar to what richard said um but different in that jesus meets you at your thirst and my mm. dad died when i was really young yeah. And so for me, it's always gets back to the fatherhood of God. Wow. And it always gets back to, and it's connected to grace as well, because it gets, and I frequently find myself doing this if I'm preaching, giving an altar call, that I get to the prodigal son, because mm. it's the father running out. Yeah. That, that wow. the father's always going to yeah. be for yeah. you and always going to love you. Wow. And so, yeah, that for me is a bottom line revelation that God is my father, that he never left me fatherless. Wow. Which I think is, you know, f whether you've had a father or not, you need, everyone needs to hear that, don't they? Alex. I grew up in a very atheist household and I remember seeing an Easter poster uh, driving past the church and it was a cheesy one and it was like um, something about Jesus and, on the cross. And I said to mum, mum, I just don't get how a guy dying on two bits of wood is relevant or meaningful. And my mum, even though being an atheist, was like, don't be facetious, Alex, don't you? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I still don't get it. Yeah, We're meant to be on the same so. team. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. And... And then, but I have through a lot of study just become so convinced mm. that who he said he was is who he was. Mm. That wow. the resurrection was not spiritual, not metaphorical, it was physical. Yeah. That he was perfectly human and perfectly God. That he was a, the son of God, that he is God. And for me, that has changed everything because I have grown up 
not only being an atheist, but then becoming a Christian and feeling the pressure to conform my version, my understanding right. of truth to what culture is telling me truth right. is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I just feel utterly convicted so and good. feel no guilt, no pressure, no, I feel completely secure in standing in front of anyone. I don't care how much smarter they are than me. I know that I will be able to present who Jesus is mm. because he's, it's true to me, not just on yeah. an intellectual yeah. level, but yeah. it's on yeah. a spiritual conviction yeah. level and, and that I will not be convinced or pressured by the world to think anything of differently of him mm. in so far as I'm not saying I'm not open to new ideas, but that what, what we know about him and what we confirm about him in the Nicene Creed and what we confirm about yeah. his uh, deity, his physical resurrection, the virgin birth, that is true. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is the gospel and it's worth celebrating. It brings me so much comfort. Well, yeah. mm. oh, I love that. That's so good. For me, I guess, being a Bible teacher, my life message is the power of the Word of God. Yeah. Um, I was a super prophetic child that um, dreams and visions uh, but did not know the Word and got myself into a lot of trouble um, being emotionally out of control without a balanced life. Wow. So um, I had this encounter with the Word of God just on a daily basis being my foundation and that transformational power. Mm. I remember at night sleeping with my Bible on my chest <laughs> because my emotions were so out mm. of control. The only thing that was wow. the anchor, the only thing that was keeping me grounded was the Bible, the Word, and it was the only thing that was truth. And even the other day, God was reminding me the power of the Word of God, that when you open that book, that it's yeah. not information, it's transformation. Yeah. It's, yes. not, it's not just feeding your intellect. It's not just mm. feeding your ego. Mm. It's transforming your life. It's yeah. giving you freedom. It's giving you, setting you free, changing. It can, we were talking the other day, it cannot help but to change you. Mm. It's like a yeah. fixer. Yeah, yeah, it just yeah. has to do something in you. Mm. So my life message is read the Bible and the power of the Word of God. And that if there's anything lacking, that that word will be able to sustain you and feed you. So that's why I'm a Bible teacher. Oh, incredible. <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. Okay, um, let's touch on delivering theology to someone who is maybe a new Christian, maybe someone who's watching now or, or maybe someone new at your church. How do we deliver a, a big story really, really simply, James? Yeah, I think um, clarifying for people is really, really, really important because I think we can be lazy as Christians just to use language maybe that we've either grown up with or mm. been yeah. Christians for a long time. Yeah. And I think I think simplifying things for people that it's, it's digestible, that it's actually, you know, I love Pastor Phil's analogy around preaching is that you're baking something. You want to make it actual digestible. Yeah. And I think that takes time. I think it takes, in terms of preaching, I think that takes the longest time. Yeah. Is not necessarily what you want to say, but how you say it in a way that yeah. people mm. are going to be able to receive it really mm. quickly yeah. in one sentence that's going to make sense. I think um, allowing, I remember, Pastor Richard said something around this, around allowing people to have questions and leaving people with questions. And oh, so that we're not, we're not driving the discussion yeah. of what we feel we need to let them know. Yeah. I think letting people do their journey yeah. um, and just ensuring that as they're doing their journey, we're clear. And when we're not clear, it's okay to say, hey, I don't know right now. Yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. me go and look yeah. into that and get back to you. Yeah. We're not yeah. feeling again that pressure to be right, yeah. um, but, but rather just ready to do the journey, being clear. Yeah. Wow. Anyone else got secrets to clarity? And I, I think in the book of Hebrews, it, it, basically the writer talks about the difference between milk and meat. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think talking about people who are really young in their faith, they're described by John in 1 John chapter 2 as babies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to do everything for a baby. Yeah. They're yeah, completely yeah. reliant yeah. upon us. Yeah. Yeah. They cannot do something for themselves yeah, right. except cry, except alert us mm -hmm. to the fact that they have yeah. something going wrong, right. which could be they need some sleep, they need, need some food, they need a nappy change perhaps, or they need a cuddle, yeah. you know, because that's yeah, yeah. part of their growth and development. Yeah. Right. I have transformed my thinking around this issue of discipleship for the youngest of Christians that it is completely our role, right. not theirs, mm. wow. to engage them. Yeah. Right. Wow. That, that right. waiting for them to call when they've got the next question mm. is probably a really, it, well, we're going to leave them on the doorstep to die yeah. by doing that. Wow. Whereas if we engage with them, which is mm. the, the capacity for them to discover, mm. uh, but you're there, present yeah. with them, mm as somebody giving milk, which is easily digestible, yeah. but which is, because it's easily digestible, means that you've got to feed them again real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. right. Because the metabolism uses it really yeah, yeah. quickly. So it's like, there's going to be another, and you know what? Yeah. They'll cry at the most inappropriate yeah. times. You'll be, <laughs> you'll be working yeah. somewhere and you'll get this phone call. Pastor, I just wanted, and you're thinking, 
I just like. Is the unimportant? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and because that's that's the person that I'm yeah, there to yeah, minister yeah, to at that yeah, point in time. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And when I pay attention to the fact that they they're on milk, mm. they are young, mm. has a baby. Yeah. I I, I shift my mm. deal yeah. for them. Yeah. Again, when I was doing some study. Jesus often to used, it's called orientation by disorientation, right. which is, you know, some fancy words to say that he flipped our thinking by telling a story that's so close to what we, the, what we can go there mm-hmm. with. And then all of a sudden the yeah, only yeah. twists it. Oh, and so then yeah. you're in there and then you're bang. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. He, and he's kind of just, um, you know, given you a, a, a spiritual, you know, Got, you've gone to the spiritual chiropractor yeah. because Jesus has taken you on a journey mm. and just adjusted your thinking, wow. which is a really interesting way of looking at a lot of the parables because a lot of the Jewish mm. people at the time would have been sucked right into some of those stories. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then at the end they're like, what? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What? Yeah, that's brilliant. And it's not the answer. A plus B's been to equal C. Yeah. Yeah, why is the father taking the prodigal son home? But yeah. I love, yeah. I love yeah. the fact that Jesus let them develop yeah. He, yeah. he let them wrestle with things mm. and he didn't rescue them straight away or tell them what to think. Right. He yeah. led them and mm. let them wrestle with it and, and left them in there. I think with, with um, new Christians, we've got to let them have the arguments, let them have the conversations yeah. with us, yeah. let them. Yeah. Yeah. God wrestled with our revelation and got us to this point. Mm. We've got to let them mm. yeah. have that journey of revelation. Yeah. Let them talk about it and have a safe zone where they can. Mm. I love that. And, and talking on that too, um, People get some random stuff from the internet. Too. The internet's oh, yeah. wonderful, yeah. but when it comes to... A guy in to... a basement that knows all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they've got all the answers. Well, they do, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's all about end so times, too. <laughs> it's true. Very often if somebody's got a question, theological question, that's the first yeah. place yeah. they're yeah, going to yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. Now, Alex, you're a guru in this area. Um, but it's true, right? There's some... There's some random stuff, obviously, there. Yeah, I think that creates a pressure on people to have an opinion online because... Um, and this goes back to that point I made about the pressure to be right, because you can be fact-checked so quickly, yeah. you yeah, are hesitant yeah, to put anything yeah. out there yeah. for a couple of reasons. What, well, th- what I'm saying now might not be true in 10 years, something else might come out, yeah. and so therefore I'm trapped on this. And we know of plenty of pastors who preach some certain messages on social behaviour in the 70s that now they're getting hanged for in, the, in, in today's time yeah. because it's such a difference in culture. Mm-hmm. And so... I've witnessed a lot of people be afraid of going online. I I respect that, I get that, and I understand why people would be hesitant and conservative in what they publish online. But um, the other reality is is that uh, if you go past a bus stop, everyone's looking down on their phones and they're online. If you are on a bus, everyone's looking down on it. Everyone is on their phones. We're on social media. This is not a novelty. This is it. This is the world now. And so we've got to be out there. Yeah. Otherwise, what's happening is that uh, publications that have a message that we disagree with or people that we have a message that we disagree with are influencing people's worldviews. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. So in regards to the weird stuff on the internet, that's totally true. So let's just be the voice like we are yeah. in our supermarket or at our workplace. Let's also be a voice for truth or right. grace online. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great answer. Yeah. How, do you, how do you deal with it? Dealing with theology that's wrong and someone's adamant that it's right. Mm. But it's... It's a deal. It's a bit of a deal breaker. It's something that needs to be addressed. That's tough, right? Well, it is. I I guess, again, I'd go, people are definitely moving, hopefully, toward Christ. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit's got a role in conviction. I presume that he's going to do his job because he's better at it than I am. So I don't necessarily see myself as having to do anything. I think it comes back to the initial elements of things of doctrine and dogma and opinion. Mm -hmm. If it's opinion stuff, I'll just leave them with it and all the rest of it. I'm happy for great diversity Mm -hmm. um, on things that are essential, unity. Not a question about that, and that's all there is to it. That's about the issues of dogma. Um, If people want to express themselves passionately, I would expect that because yeah. that's it's in the realm of belief and so people yeah. are generally passionate. Yeah. But if they do that with an exclusivity, which yeah. is right and wrong and mm. you're the wrong one because yeah. they're always the right one, uh, if they're not prepared to entertain the fact that uh, others may have a valid alternate mm. opinion yeah. mm. and they hold their opinion in a way which is destructive mm. and divisive, uh, I will address it yeah. and I'll have a conversation with people. Uh, in that frame. And I've had to have those kinds of conversations. Mm. But it's about the way they carry that conversation or that opinion. Yeah, right, right. Mm. A lot of the time, if they're clearly wrong, if they're, if they're going, look, you can get saved by any means you like, all roads lead to, he- lead to heaven, I'm going to have the conversation about dogma. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I'm going to go, well, actually, I've got to correct because we've got to disciple people and yeah, there is sure. a point of correction in those yeah. things. Yeah, sure. so, so, yes, that's got to be done at that point in time. But if it's not in that frame, yeah. then I'm going to try and lead them gently. One trusts that they will trust leadership in the church yeah. to be for them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, right? Yeah. right? And that we're that's loving so them mm-hmm. along that yeah. process. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. And that as we allow them to discover the truth, because you bring them back into God's word, yeah. you help them see God's word for what God's word is saying. And it's fascinating how people just go, yeah, well, I didn't believe this before, but now I am recognizing that mm. there were things I've had to. Mm. And that's, but that's time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. also engagement. Yeah. yeah. I, I've got to be engaged mm. in their world for that. Yeah. 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 I've got to have connect group leaders, other pastors engaged in people's world, actually doing discipleship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not you press a button; it all happens automatically. Discipleship happens by engagement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so and that, that's been so important for me as a young person learning theology is that um, having people engage. I, I view it like when I'm driving with, or I'm, it's like, am I coming at a brick wall right now, or am I coming at a crash mat? Like if I crash into you, it's going to be safe and I'm going to be okay or you're going to break me. Right. Yeah. And if you keep wow. breaking people, they're eventually going to see you as a threat or the enemy yeah. rather than something they can comfortably yeah. and confidently talk through their theo- theological tensions. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I think also um, really important is that on the things that we hold as dogma and even doctrine, that's really important in terms yeah. of your church community. Yeah. I think being yeah. consistent yeah. Yeah. So I think sometimes there's so much pressure at times that particularly if someone has an agenda or they've already kind of formed their opinion and they're just coming to let you know that you're wrong. I think, <laughs> I think, I think you can feel a pressure at times to maybe out of relationship love to kind of get a bit wishy-washy about stuff. And I think that really damages mm. not only for that person but then for all the other people that have been faithful and holding mm. to mm. things to try and help a generation through a lot of different questions about a lot, a lot of different yeah. things. I think it's really important that we're consistent. Yeah. Um, I d- and I'm not just talking about from a leadership level. I think for parents, I think for peers, friendships, things that you see online even just, I think that if you're consistent and you don't have to be rude or arrogant or anything, but in love, you're just, you're just yeah. hey, cool, you may disagree, but this is what we're believing and this is what we're holding to and we're not mm. shifting on this. And yeah. That's that perseverance message. Yeah, uh, I know, yeah, see, yeah, you see yeah. it coming yeah. out in everybody. Just to help some pastors, uh, we're just about to wrap up, but just to, just to maybe help some pastors out there too, if they're dealing with people that have very, very strong opinions uh, in, in their congregation, say, from what it sounds like, what you mentioned to Rich, it sounds like it can almost come from a heart issue, yeah. you know, rather than their mental issue. There's something more. Mm. No, they're passionate about things, but they've been taught something. They've come to a position for a set of reasons. Uh, the fact that we've all got different life messages is because we've all come to Christ in a different yeah. frame yeah. and all the rest of it. Mm. So part of it is the pastoral response of going, okay, what has informed them to get to this point? place? Why Why do they hold yeah. this in the manner that they do? Why is it so darn important for them? Because yeah. it's like, you know, they, yeah. you just touched on something. And whoa. Yeah. You know, now, you know, the reason that if you've had a burn and, and you touch that, it's raw. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it hurts. Yeah. And right. commonly that's what's going on in somebody yeah. and they hold something anyway. Yeah. So part of it is helping them understand that they can hold things passionately without it being destructive right. yeah. to yeah. people. If they're unteachable, and the scriptures are, remind us that there are people who are unteachable, mm-hmm. yeah. then you've got to deal with the unteachability yeah. at that point yeah, in time, totally. whilst always remembering that the Holy Spirit's at work. Yeah. I keep asking, Holy Spirit, what are you doing in this person's yeah, life? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is it? Because maybe they're, because the Holy Spirit's at yeah. them, yeah. That he's yeah. working yeah. on them, yeah. and so it's kind of flared yeah. for yeah. them. Okay, I've got to pay attention to all of those right. things. Yeah. But when it's destructive, to the other mm. people in the congregation. Yeah. Mm. When they are, and we've had at different times people who have held views in such an inappropriate manner mm. that mm. I've just had to say, look, it's it's time for you to just stop talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, right. not appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. The manner in which you're speaking is disrespectful to the people. And as a result, you're losing mm. the ground from which you think you can speak. Mm. So their level of influence is being diminished even as they're trying to influence yeah. because of the manner of their influence. Yeah. 
And so it's, that's unhelpful. Yeah. And, and I don't want people to be diminished in the eyes of other people mm -hmm. because they're foolish in the way that they mm -hmm. present yeah. or speak yeah. and things like that. Some people are. So I'm trying to protect them. That's pastoral. But I'm also trying to protect the wider body mm -hmm. by saying, not on, it's time to stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we all want you to be a pastor. Hands up who wants to <laughs> as their pastor now. Guys, thank you so much. What a fantastic chat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the Roundtable on Theology. Loads more coming up.